Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Pioneer Valley Baptist Church this Sunday evening. We're going to get started. We'll stand together. We're going to sing the chorus of Because He Lives to get started this morning. The words are in your bulletin. They'll also be on the screen. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He started with our first song this evening, song number 175, Dwelling in Beulah Land. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling, then I know the sins of earth be set on every hand, doubt and fear and of earth in vain to me are calling none of these shall move me from Beulah land I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry oh yes I'm the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. On the last viewing here the works of God, I sing in contemplation. Hearing now His blessed voice, I see the way He the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Well, amen. It's good to see you here this evening. Good to have Charlie with us. And uh, good to see folks here, folks by the radio, folks on the internet. We did have a little trouble with the microphone today, and we're working on that. It wasn't the sound room. It wasn't anybody else. It was the microphones. And so we're working on that. Be praying we get that work through. Uh, but we're still trusting the Lord for miracles here. It was good to see Debbie get baptized this morning and follow the Lord in faith and and uh, it's good to see people still getting saved and baptized even during uh, the coronavirus. Let's begin. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you that we can be in your house. Thank you that one day we will be dwelling in Beulah land. But until then, help each one of us to do your will, to serve you. And Lord, try to please you with the very best that we can. In Jesus' name, amen. Now you can be seated. Our next song this evening is song number 560, Oh, It Is Wonderful to Be a Christian. Life has purpose now and never had before. There is meaning to each day and even more. For a joy and peace I can't explain is mine. Since I found new life in Christ my Lord divine. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. 
Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. And the hope of heaven's glory thrills me so. Where I'll live with Christ forevermore, I know. That is why the things of earth I loosely hold. I've eternal riches better far than gold. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. All right, I have a few announcements. I just want to thank everyone for being here tonight. If you are a first-time visitor or have been here before but haven't filled out a visitor's card, if you could do that, there should be one on the back of the chair there somewhere in front of you. And then you can give it to the ushers on the way out and put it in the offering plate. If you have a cell phone, if you haven't turned it off, please do so now. Um, family room, there's a family room in the back for those with children for your convenience and to keep them from disrupting the service. So the services are have not changed so far. So there's Sunday morning at 9.30 and 10.30, Sunday night at 6, Wednesday night at 7, RU is Friday night at 7. There's no children's uh, programs or nursery until things uh, loosen up a little bit, but you can follow the uh, kids' programs online, and we'll keep you updated if there are any changes to that. Uh, there is a fundraiser for the Springfield Pregnancy Care Center, so if you'd like to donate to that, you can do a check, cash, just put it in an envelope, designate it, write on the check, whatever it's for, and then write it out to Pioneer Valley Baptist Church, and then all the donations will be given right after Father's Day. Uh, as far as offer offerings go, if you have an offering, you want to give something, you can give it at the end of the service. As you walk out the doors, the ushers will have a plate, and you can just drop it right in there. You can also still give online or text or mail it in. Thank you. I got a great letter this week from a missionary, and they're seeking mission support. We didn't have a missions conference. I'm working on doing a mini missions conference in August. We're also going to work on vacation Bible school in August. Won't be like normal VBS. Uh, we won't be running vans and buses. Uh, we'll have limited transportation. But uh, what we're probably going to do is just eliminate the class time, but keep all the other portions of it so people can social distance. But be praying for our missions uh, conference. Got a letter this week. Uh, missionary. Uh, said that they are doing radio stations in Muslim countries. And they're seeing close to 16,000 people a week respond to the gospel. And this is Iraq, Iran, uh, the whole Middle East type area. People are actually responding. I would like to support that ministry. Uh, so we're going to try to have them in uh, uh, sometime when they're up in this area. I want to hear a little more about that. But getting the gospel message into the Muslim countries is an important thing. Getting the gospel into the inner cities. I'm going to encourage some church planters to come over to Springfield and get a, a church planted in the inner cities. Um, but we want to get, get some things going. And so just be praying about that. Be praying about the missions conference, vacation Bible school, uh, the different things that will be coming up this summer and... Be praying about the building program. We have put that on hold for right now, depending on God's leading and guiding, but we're not going to give up on that. And so you keep that in the first and foremost of your prayers, and we'll look forward to what God's going to do there. Our last song this evening is song number 272. We'll sing A Child of the King. Once I was clothed in the rags of my sin, wretched and poor, lost and lonely within, but with wondrous compassion, the King of all kings, in pity and love, took me under his wings, oh yes, oh I'm a child of the King, His royal blood now flows in my veins, and I, who was wretched and poor, now can sing, praise God, praise God, I'm a child of the King. 
Amen. Let's take our Bibles tonight, and we're still in the will of God, 1 Peter chapter 2. We have two sermons left on the will of God. Then we're going to be starting a series called All Scripture, and I'm looking forward to that, but I'm looking forward to tonight's message. Now, we're going to use our Bibles a lot tonight, so keep your Bible open, and uh, we do have quite a bit of Scripture reading 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to read verse 13 through 24. I'm going to ask you to read the even number verses with me. I'll read the odd number verses. 1 Peter is right before 2 Peter, if that helps you out to find it. So, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 13. Submit yourselves therefore to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience sake toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your fault ye take it patiently, but if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called... Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed." And boy, there's a lot in there tonight, and obviously we can't cover every bit of that passage tonight, but we're going to hit the highlights of that. Again, as I shared this morning, it's making sure the soil of our hearts prepared and the seed is planted, and as the seed is planted, let it grow. And uh, we can learn some things there, but to me, I want to focus on verse 15, for so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. I think if uh, this virus has done anything, it's revealed a couple of things, but one of those things it's revealed is there's a lot of ignorance out there about the church and about serving God. And uh, boy, you don't want to get out there and get defensive and, and fighting with people. What you want to do is get out there and share the Bible says, contend for the faith, not to be contentious about our faith. Uh, But the Bible very clearly lays out here for us what the will of God is when we're interacting with other people. And so I want to give you four thoughts tonight. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then I want to get into four thoughts to help us as we interact with other people according to the will of God. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for each person you brought. Thank you for those listening by radio, those listening by internet. Help each one of us to grow 
through the word of God. Help us to be challenged. Help us to be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. I think one of the greatest examples of this, the Bible shows us, is Acts chapter 6 through 8 when it talks about Stephen in the Bible. Stephen was not a pastor, he was a deacon in the first church. Do you know why they appointed deacons? In Acts chapter 5 and 6, the church had grown so large exponentially that they, nobody was taking care of the Grecian widows. So they found seven men that were full of the Holy Ghost and good works and they ordained them to be deacons. Stephen was one of them. Now, obviously, during the apostolic time, there was a lot more uh, involvement in the church and Stephen was preaching... But I don't want you to miss this. He was a spirit-filled deacon doing the will of God. And the Bible says in Acts 6, 9, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians. And, and I really wish I had the time to develop all of that. Alexandria, Egypt has always been the seat of doctrinal heresy. Now why is that important? Because a lot of the doctrinal heresy that we deal with today started in Alexandria, Egypt, all the way back before the time of Christ and during the time of Christ and even here. But I want you to notice something. When Stephen was disputing with those that believed false doctrine, the Bible says this about uh, Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. In other words... Stephen, according to the will of God, spoke the truth and it helped people. It didn't hurt people. And as a Christian, we ought to be looking to help people, but we need to understand that sometimes people aren't going to accept the truth, are they? Because we read in Acts chapter 7 that Stephen was brought before the Sanhedrin. He preached a wonderful sermon outlining the history of Israel and how Christ was the Messiah And the Bible says that they began to to rail on Stephen and it says Stephen had the face of an angel. Now, I don't know about you, but when somebody starts going after me, I'm not sure I'll have the face of an angel. But Stephen did. And the Bible says in Acts 8, when they took him out and stoned him to death, he said the same thing Jesus did, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. Now, why is that important? Again, because Stephen wasn't focusing on the circumstances, he was focusing on doing the will of God for his life. And if I could get Christians in this day and time to to not be so me-focused and start being Savior-focused, boy, we would uh, uh, grow in our spiritual life. We'd be able to pursue the will of God. And and, uh, I think it's interesting in Acts chapter 7 that it says they laid their coats down at whose feet? Saul's feet, who would become the Apostle Paul. In other words, Stephen's testimony while he was doing the will of God was so powerful that uh, a Saul, who was a religious Pharisee, was converted, I'm um, absolutely convinced, when he was on the road to Emmaus and Jesus spoke to him and said, Paul... How can you kick against the pricks? He was talking about the convictions of Stephen's holy life. Now where am I going with that? Hey, every single one of us need to decide as a Christian, we're going to have a holy life. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but it certainly means we're going to live according to the will of God. And boy, when you do that, it is such a powerful testimony that the world can't speak against it. Uh, even those wicked men uh, uh, looking at Stephen, they, it, look, it said that he, they looked on him steadfastly and he had the face of an angel. And so uh, uh, tonight as we consider this, you know, as we go through life, how many of you have ever had somebody throw verbal rocks at you? Boy, they, they judge your motives. I know why you do what you do and, and I know why you're... Hey, Christian, we need to be like Stephen. Stephen shut out all the noise and said, hey, I'm going to do the will of God, whether it pleases everybody, whether everybody's okay with it, whether they're not okay with it. And he said, more importantly, I'm going to do it with the right spirit. And 
Excuse me, I've mentioned this before. You can do right with the wrong spirit. Is everybody with me? We need to make sure that when we do the will of God, we're doing it with the right spirit. Hey, what we do, we're doing to serve and to please God, not to please other people. If your life revolves around pleasing other people, you're going to have a pretty miserable life. How many of you understand people are hard to please? How many of you understand that we even misunderstand each other sometimes? But isn't it a good thing that God never misunderstands when we're trying to serve Him and to accomplish His will in our lives? So let's look through 1 Peter chapter 2. Number one, how do we do uh, uh, well, serve God in the face uh, uh, of people that obviously don't understand what we're doing? Number one, submit to godly authority. You know, I find people... Did everybody get an outline? Uh, the outlines have... Uh, uh, they're up here in the middle, and I know sometimes people didn't. Ray, if you can grab a few outlines. We're trying to do this as hands-free as we can, uh, uh, but sometimes... And uh, uh, we're also... Uh, I'm excited. We're going to try to uh, start this Wednesday doing the services... Uh, on Facebook Live and recording them so we can get them up. Uh, Brother James is diligent about it and he gets it up on YouTube, but a lot of times there's so many churches uploading their stuff on YouTube, it takes a couple of hours for our service to get up there. And so we're going to try to do Facebook Live along with recording the services. We're just trying to keep this thing moving in a good and positive direction, but submitting to godly authority. Now I want you to look at verse 13 with me, if you would. Submitting yourself to every ordinance of who? Man, for the Lord's sake, whether it be a king is supreme or unto governors, is unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, for the praise of them that do well. Now, I'm going to say two things here. Number one, I want to give you an illustration. I know the church personally. In Indianapolis, Indiana, there was a, a, a church, the Indianapolis Baptist Temple. The pastor was Greg Dixon. And I heard him preach in person. The guy was a fabulous preacher. But they only had one problem. They didn't believe they should obey the government in anything. So they didn't pay any payroll taxes. They didn't pay any of the other things. And they said, we don't need license plates. We don't have to submit to the laws of men. How many of you understand that's foolish tonight? That's foolishness. When it says submit to every ordinance of man, do you realize that was written in the Roman Empire and Nero was in charge? That's probably a little more difficult than our government. And uh, boy... Uh, uh, they had this big article. The church was actually a church. It was running about 1,200 people. They were soul winning, doing a fabulous job, but they got this harebrained idea that they didn't need to submit to the ordinance of men. And finally, a, a judge in 2000 said, hey, we're just going to confiscate your buildings, and they lost everything. And boy, they came out and said, boy, we're being persecuted. That's not persecution. That's stupidity. Do you understand what I'm saying? If it's a, here's the difference, and this second thing I want to say. If they ever, the governor ever comes out in this state and says you can't preach the Bible, you can't have church, and you can't do what you feel God wants you to, you mark it down, I'll go to jail for that. But if the governor says, hey, we want you to have some things in place for safety, I don't agree with some of those things. And I've told the governor I don't agree with some of those things. And right now our church is involved with a lawsuit because I believe the governor overstepped his authority. And I'm not afraid to say that. But having said that, if it's something simple and it's safe, we're going to submit to the ordinance of man because I want people to see hey, there's a church that's trying to do the will of God, but they're trying to do it the right way. Uh, they're not trying to just say, hey, bless God, we're going to do what we think we ought to do, and we're not going to follow. No, the Bible says, submit to the ordinance of man. Here's the difference. Paul said when he stood before the Sanhedrin, I ought to obey God rather than man. 
If there ever comes a time when man asks us to violate, here's a, uh, uh, here's a very good and up-to-date example. We have a men's bathroom and a ladies' bathroom. There are not a hundred genders, there's two. They're God-given genders. And to say anything different than that is to rebel against God. And by the way, when I was uh, watching something yesterday, how many of you remember the weather underground from 1970s? Trying to blow things up and uh, rebel against, you know the, the five tenets of the weather underground? The number five tenet was to overthrow God. Do you know who's picked all that stuff up? All these radical groups that are rioting right now have picked up what the Weather Underground left behind and one of their tenants is to overthrow God. I'm going to tell you this right now. That's one thing I'll die for. I said I would die for that. But if it's something simple where I can submit to the authority of Caesar, Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are... Caesar and unto God the things that are God's. And boy, we need to be able, this first Peter teaches us that submitting to authority is submitting to God. I was just talking to Brother Jerry before the church. I'm amazed how many people today struggle with submitting to authority, period. Whether it's a boss at work, whether it's a pastor in a church, whether it's, and, and by the way, uh, I was talking to somebody else. As your pastor, I very rarely, rarely ever pull out the pastor card. Does anybody know what the pastor card is? The pastor card is Hebrews 13, verse 7 and 17 that says, Submit to them that have the rule over you. And boy, uh, uh, people, boy, the minute the pastor says, Hey, uh, but, but you missed the second half of verse 17 that says, For they watch care for your soul. And boy, people, oh, Pastor, now you're not going to tell me what to. You're not going to tell me how to live. You're not going to tell me. That's that rebellious spirit. You know the Bible says rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. That doesn't mean the pastor's always right, but it does mean he's watch caring for your soul. And if he talks to you about some spiritual things, we all need to be able to back up, be able to back down, and be able to humble ourselves. The difference between the church and the world is we have the Spirit of Christ and we ought to be able to submit uh, uh, when it's reasonable, when it's right, to the things that God's asked us to do. Number two, sacrificing for all men. You know, sacrificing used to be a doctrine that was taught in churches. Now, today, boy, we don't want to hear anything about sacrifice we don't want to hear anything about uh, sacrificing and we preached last week our time, our talent, and our treasures. But right here in uh, uh, 1 Peter 2, look at verse 16. As free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. Have you ever met a malicious Christian before? In 30 years, I've met quite a few malicious Christians. You know what a malicious Christian is? The Bible tells us that we're sheep. We're all sheep. Jesus is the great shepherd. I'm the under shepherd as a pastor. He considers us a flock of sheep. But how many of you have ever run in church to a, a nasty old goat? Uh, and the way you can tell if somebody's a nasty goat in the herd of sheep is they're butting everybody. Well, uh, I, I, you know, pastor says, hey, let's go soul winning, but uh, let's, let's uh, raise money for the, the, the building program, but, and boy, they're just butting everybody, butting everything, just constantly uh, uh, causing all kinds of problems. No, the Bible teaches us sacrificial living. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, not a dead one. I've heard people say, well, I'll die for the Lord. If you won't live for Him, you won't die for Him. That's the bottom line. A living sacrifice simply means when you put it in context of 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 17 says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Four simple statements, but very powerful ones. You know what it means? Sacrificial means I'm willing to put my will down 
so that it advances the kingdom of God. Boy, I, I, I will tell you plainly, if God didn't call me to be a pastor, I would not be living in Massachusetts. But this morning we shared uh, Philippians that said, whatever state I am, there with to be content, so I'm happy in Massachusetts. And that's not what the Bible means there. Uh, but what it does mean is, hey, listen, if you're going to serve God, don't look at sacrificing for God as you're doing God some big favor. Is everybody with me? You're not doing God any big favors. God's done you a big favor by saving you. And boy, anything that I can do to demonstrate my love back to God is a bonus. Uh, somebody mentioned to me the other day, Pastor, you said you were going to sell your boat to uh, help with the building program. And boy, I'm in the process of doing that. Brother James is helping me. Uh, do I want to do that? No, but it's a sacrifice. It's reasonable. I've used it once in four years. I, I love fishing and I love the boat and uh, I would like to keep it, but it's not doing me any earthly good. Is everybody with me? And if I can donate the money to a, a, a gymnasium and a school that's going to get kids educated for God, I'm willing to sell that. I don't need all that stuff. And boy, we don't, we don't talk about it enough, and Christians don't live it enough, the sacrificial Christian life. But boy, when you decide, I'm going to do that, and boy, I, I'll say this, I thank God we have some Christians that are willing to sacrifice. And I'm not going to name any names, I'm not going to rob them of their blessing. And I mentioned it Wednesday night, but we had two ladies that spent nine hours here uh, weeding and cleaning the gardens out. And guess what? We still have about nine hours worth of work uh, left on the gardens around the church. It's just, it's busy work. But when Christians come and sacrifice their time and do that, it frees Brother James and I up to go out and minister to people what we're called to do. When James is stuck here mowing lawns and I'm here cleaning buildings, uh, we're glad to do that. I don't mind doing that. But that's not the greatest use of my time as a pastor. That's not the greatest use of James's time as the assistant pastor. Boy, when we say, hey, I'll sacrifice, and many of you said, I'll be glad to mow. Praise the Lord. I hope you're around when it's time to shovel. And uh, somebody said, do you mind mowing so much? And I said, not on your life. You don't have to shovel grass. Amen? And, uh, but... Sacrificial living, it helps all of us. Uh, one of the most prolific atheists in American history was a guy named Robert Ingersoll. He used to rail on God and he wrote books about how God doesn't exist. He found out two seconds after he shut his eyes, God does exist. But Robert Ingersoll said this in a surprising, he said, my Aunt Sarah is a committed Christian. And he said, I can tell you that God doesn't exist and rail against God, but he said, my aunt's testimony is so sincere and so sacrificial, there's nothing I can say to refute her life. That is exactly what First Peter is talking about tonight. Boy, as Christians, we need to get back to that old-fashioned holiness that's blameless before the world's eyes. Number three, struggling respectfully. Struggling. Re How many of you understand sometimes life can be a struggle? Have you ever had to struggle with a fellow? I found Christians are more, are harder to struggle with than the unsaved world is sometimes. And uh, struggling respectfully, verse 18 through uh, verse 20. It says, servants be subject to your masters. And I realize that was talking about slaves back then, but we can translate that to employees, employers. We can be servants of Christ. Uh, excuse me, servants one to another. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience sake toward God endure grief, suffering what? Wrongfully. In other words, if somebody accuses you wrongfully and you're struggling with it, it goes on to say in verse 20, what glory is it if you're buffeted for your fault, you take it patiently. 
But if you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. What's the next phrase there? This is what? It's acceptable with God. Hey, Christian, you want to live an authentic, real Christian life? When other people are criticizing you, take it without answering them back. That's what the verses go on to say in 1 Peter, that when Jesus was reviled, he reviled not again. He didn't argue. He didn't answer back. Instead, he said, God will take care of it. There's been some situations in my life, and I'm sure in your life, where I've had to step back and say, okay, God will take care of it. And if he doesn't take care of it in this life, he'll take care of it in the next life. And boy, there's often, uh, uh, we need to... Step back and see the big picture. And when we're struggling with things, realize life isn't all about us. Just say, you know what? The big picture is I'm trying to serve God here. I'm trying to keep focused on His will. How many of you know Satan's going to try to get you off of doing God's will? Satan's going to try to get you discouraged. He's going to try to get you angry. He's going to try to get you upset. He's going to try to do anything that he can to get to you. But I promise you, if you stay on the will of God, and uh, a, a lady came to her pastor, and the pastor said, How you doing, sister? And she said, Oh, I'm doing pretty good under the circumstances. And she thought that her pastor was going to say, Oh, I'm feeling sorry for you, and I'm praying for you. No, he said, Sister, what are you doing under the circumstances? We're supposed to walk above the circumstances. And Christian, I want to encourage you tonight. Sometimes we're going to struggle a little bit, but I've got good news for you. It's only going to last a little while down here, and then we're going to see our Savior, and we'll be able to sing that song, It will be worth it all when I see Jesus. Number four and lastly, suffering according to Jesus' example. Verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered, leaving us what? An example, that ye should follow in his steps. Now, don't go looking for suffering, all right? It will find you, I promise. And uh, the Bible says that if we're going to follow Jesus' example, suffering is part of that. Already mentioned sacrifice is a doctrine not preached on much anymore. So is suffering. Boy, some of the sweetest Christians I've ever met are people that were suffering through cancer, suffering through just health, debilitating health problems. Fanny Crosby, 8,000 poems. Many of the hymns we sing, brighten the corner where you are. Blinded as a small child by a doctor putting the wrong drops in her eyes. She could have been bitter about life. She could have been angry. She could have been a victim like all these hoodlums running around the streets of America today. But she said, no, God had a purpose for this suffering. And boy, she wrote some of the most beautiful hymns that we sing today. And a preacher said to her, what if God had given you your sight, Fanny Crosby? And she said, I'm glad he didn't because the first face I'm ever going to see is that of Jesus Christ. Boy, think about that. Suffering with blindness. Do, your, do this sometime. Go home and, and get all the sharp objects out of the way first, okay? Blindfold yourself and walk around your house without sight. We rarely ever do anything like that. Boy, you try uh, blindfolding yourself and walking around the room where you can't see and very quickly you're going to appreciate the gift of sight God's given you. Uh, plug your ears where you can't hear anything and try to communicate with people. My wife accuses me of that all the time. No, she doesn't. Uh, but uh, uh, for all of us, hey, we need to understand uh, 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 suffering is part of life, but boy, suffering according to the will of God, following the steps of Jesus can be a beautiful testimony to a lost and dying world. I wish I had time tonight to go into 2 Timothy chapter 2. 
Uh, but I, I, I want you to think, and this isn't even in your outline, but I want to give you four things from 2 Timothy chapter 2 about suffering. It is a faithful saying, if we are dead with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we suffer with Him, we shall reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. If we believe not, yet He abideth faithful, He cannot deny Himself. By the way, that is a scripture that teaches you cannot lose your salvation. He can't deny Himself. It's also a scripture that does not teach you will lose your salvation. If we deny Him, He'll deny us. Know what it means when you deny Christ down here as a Christian. Let me give you a very good example. If our daughters decide to deny dad's will, guess what? They're still my daughter, but they're going to have a rough relationship and they're not going to get the things they want. Is everybody with me? And so when we deny the Lord as a Christian by living a sinful life down here, we miss out on the blessings of God. And in a moment, we'll get to the judgment seat of Christ. And the Bible says there are going to be Christians that get to heaven, yet so as by fire. What's that mean? They barely made it into heaven uh, because they denied the Lord. But don't miss the first part of that. Let me give you four things that I think are powerful statements here and we'll finish tonight. Number one, there is a guaranteed resurrection. This isn't in the outline, so don't get nervous. You can write it down for extra credit. Uh, there's a guaranteed resurrection. It is faithful saying, if we be dead with Him, we shall live with Him. What's it mean to die with Christ? Galatians 5.24 They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust thereof. Romans 6.12 Likewise reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus. So there's a guaranteed resurrection. Number two, there's a guaranteed reign. If we suffer with Him, we shall reign with Him. Matthew 25, 21, well done, good and faithful servant. Vance Havner, a famous preacher, said this, we're wearing a lot of medals these days, but not a lot of scars. Think about that. What did Jesus say he was going to show the children of Israel when he came back? He said, I'm going to show them the scars in my hand and the spear print my side. What did he show Thomas? He said, Thomas, be not faithful, it's but believing. Look at the scars. We've got too many people interested in wearing crowns and not bearing crosses. We've got people interested in wearing medals. Look at my, my medals. I've attended church Sunday school for 50 years. I've got my faithfulness medals. But you mean, cantankerous, uh, old cuss. That doesn't help anybody. That's not a blessing to anybody. Boy, where are the, the, the Christians that are bearing scars today and bearing them with a good spirit? I mentioned it this morning, but the Apostle Paul said, Hey, I received stripes five times, received I stripes. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. But he said, I count all that joy. And boy, as a Christian, it's a guaranteed reign with Christ. Number three, it's a guaranteed reaction. If we deny Him, He will deny us. Talking about the blessings of this world. 1 Corinthians 13, 15. If, uh, 3, 15. If any, man shall, uh, uh, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Not everyone will receive a reward. Know ye therefore that they that run the race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. What's that saying? If we suffer for the Lord, there's a guaranteed resurrection, there's a guaranteed reign, there's a guaranteed reaction. And lastly, there's a guaranteed refuge. If you believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Luke 9, 23, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Luke 18, 1, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Mark 16, 15, go into all the world. What am I saying? Hey, my eternity depends on God. But so many people will trust Christ for salvation, but they won't trust Him for their life down here. If you can trust Him with your eternal life, you can trust Him with your life down here. 
If we can do His will to get saved, we ought to do His will to please Him on a daily basis. Well-doing in the will of God. How do we do that? Submit, sacrifice, struggle, suffering. You say, that doesn't sound like the Christianity I want to take part in. Then you don't belong to Christ. Because if we belong to Christ, those are part of. But that doesn't mean that it's difficult. He said, if you take my yoke upon me and learn upon you and learn of me, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So if your Christian life is difficult, who's making it difficult? Not him. We are. And let's decide tonight we're going to be a first Peter chapter two Christian. Let's decide by well-doing and doing the will of God, we're going to put to silence foolish and ignorant men. Last thing and we'll be done. This world is dying for people who are real Christians. There's a lot of uh, lip service Christians. There aren't a lot of life service Christians. Let's make sure that our life and our lips match each other by doing the will of God. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. How many of you are glad you're saved tonight? Would you raise your hand as a testimony to that? Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can put your hands down. Maybe you're here tonight and you're struggling with the will of God for your life. Pastor, would you pray with me and for me? There's a need, great or small, in my life to do the will of God. Would you be honest enough to slip your hand up? Pastor, God spoke to me tonight. Would you pray with me about a need? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, you saw each hand that was raised. You know the hearts they represent. I pray for those listening by radio, following by internet. If they don't know you as their personal Savior, may today be that day. May today be the day that they humble their hearts and their life, bow their knee, and accept you as their Savior. May they realize that they're a sinner on their way to hell, and Jesus Christ is the only way out. Lord, may we realize the Bible says to call on you, simply praying in faith sincerely to be saved. Lord, I pray for the Christians gathered with us here and by internet, by radio, that each one of us will decide the will of God is the greatest will and we're going to accomplish it. We're going to take 1 Peter chapter 2 and not only listen to it, but do life service with it. Meet the need in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Pastor comes to close out the service, we're going to say our theme verse together and then sing our closing chorus. We'll say the theme verse together, starting with the reference. Ready, begin. 1 Timothy 4.12 Be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Then we'll sing that closing chorus. We'll be dismissed in just a moment. Pastor's just making his way out to greet the folks watching in the parking lot. So if you're in the parking lot listening, don't race out really quick before he gets there. He'll say goodbye to you. Uh, the rest of us, you're welcome to be dismissed. We're going to use this side door here. If you have an offering, you can just drop it in the plate on the way out. And that way we don't have to pass plates at all. God bless you. We love you. You're dismissed.